Reset and rewind. Really? Do you know how incredibly lucky you are? Do you know how times were back then? Do you know how far we've come? Where exactly do you want to reset and rewind to? The Stone Age? Those were the exact words uttered to me by a middle-aged businessman when I spoke to him about today's topic. But I'm sure those are also familiar words to many of us here today, perhaps often spoken to us by our parents, maybe even as recent as this morning. And what our predecessors are really trying to say to us is that the world that we live in today has progressed so much that today we're at the peak of it. They say we live in an age of convenience. Gone were the days of small town hardships, so we now live global lives in modern metropolises with large shiny skyscrapers towering over us, with fancy jobs at multinational companies enabling us to grow rich, to buy and dress ourselves in the latest global fashion and get the most unimaginable gadgets from Apple stores everywhere, allowing us to access global innovations and technologies from anywhere, such as Uber letting us speed through the city at light speed whilst we enjoy our delicious Big Macs at McDonald's found at every corner. They say we live now in a future that was only once imagined possible by our parents, a world that is getting more interconnected, more centralized, a world that's getting bigger, richer, and naturally, they say, a world that's also getting better. But why aren't we satisfied? Why are so many of us here, especially the millennials, so restless when it comes to acceptance of the world? Rather than play part to it, we seek to be rebellious activists, disruptive entrepreneurs, looking to reject the world order as it is and build a new one. The reason is because we have inherited this world, a world that was essentially built yesterday. And the underlying issue is that this world was built on an economic model that was designed yesterday. And because of its simplicity of design, it's functioned so well to its purpose that we start to naturally wonder whether it overlooks other important dimensions of our society. You see, central to our economy is wealth creation, which is really its primary objective. And the reason why the accumulation of wealth has been given such importance is because it's been seen as the only realistic means of improving our standard of living. As a result, we have a society that's largely driven by the pursuit of wealth. But it's not just about that. The most effective way of accumulating wealth under our model has been the formation and ownership of businesses. Perhaps that's why so many of us want to be entrepreneurs. Perhaps that's why they say that business runs the world. But it's not just about entrepreneurship. This system is largely driven by this unique economic concept called the economies of scale. This idea that ultimate wealth comes from increasing in size, expanding in scale, making larger businesses the most attractive goal and end goal for entrepreneurs, and expansion the natural target for businesses. And as a result, this approach has created a society that is largely driven and dominated by mass production, massive companies, large industrial complexes, economies that are increasingly centralized and defined by big business. In other words, it's created our world today. But when you have a society and economy that's economically optimized in such a particular way, you inevitably have many odd and unintended consequences. And there's increasing concern because there's growing evidence that these economic laws and beliefs that so successfully govern and guided us so far do not provide the right values for development that is sustainable today, so much so that our fundamental values are at stake and we begin to really question it. To begin with, there is no doubt today that businesses have tremendous social impact and has brought a lot of impact to us. I mean, we feel it. For example, recently, the growth and the rise of ride-hailing companies like Uber and Grab has certainly changed our lives. Many would say for the better. It's brought us the social value of transportation. And I have to say, you know, we can now go out without the hassle of going out, which is an especially important issue in Asia where Parking and traffic deserves its own TED talk, really. But the point being that it's actually changed us so much, given us its value, but it's also created livelihood as well for the right drivers, financial means to them. So we're talking about great social impact, aren't we? 
Well, at the same time, there's also been emerging social issues that we can't ignore that's accompany the growth of such businesses into large-scale operations. Aggressive expansion compounded by excessive price cutting have created an immense and almost monopolistic uh, power in such companies, which are exercised at the expense and even the complete destruction of their competitors. Long existing industries effectively destroyed rapidly in a blink of an eye, putting millions in under financial impact, financial stress, largely displaced. And not only that, the ride drivers themselves find themselves increasingly dependent on and under the whims of a giant corporate big brother with ultimate control over their lives. Have they been looked after? Well, this big brother is currently looking to automate ride hailing within 10 years with investments and plans currently in action. So very soon, even the ride drivers themselves would be obsolete. And that is why there has been such intense social and political debate about the direction of these developments because their impact is socially questionable. But aside from these direct social impact, what is the impact of business and development on the cultural fabric of our society? Besides, besides, besides having Big Macs at our easy disposal, what does the opening of McDonald's truly bring to our hometown? Well, it brings an indoctrination of the fast food concept where meals and taste pellets are becoming increasingly uniform, where dinners last less than 15 minutes. Gone are the days when we sit around our dinner tables with our families over mother's home-cooked meals, perhaps a secret recipe that survived down the generations. Moments like these that are rapidly disappearing. And this has been such a globally loathed issue that there's now a growing international rebellion, ironically known as a slow food revolution, where the many towns around the world have actually boycotted the opening of McDonald's. For example, recently in Italy, they were so angry that they literally threatened Ronald McDonald, quite literally. And a lot of the protesters even resorted to using pastas and meatballs as weapons. And that's when you know something's really serious, when Italians use something so beloved to them as weapons, that's when you know. So when viewed against this context, it becomes apparent that Despite having such immense social power and also such social impact over so many lives, businesses has proven that often does not exercise its power in the best of social interests. It's not that they're devious, like some sort of evil mastermind, like some conspiracy, but quite simply under our economy and our economic model, where there is a systemic, systematic guidance of wealth maximization, businesses often commit to decisions where social interests are sidestepped and oftentimes overlooked. Therefore, paradoxically, the arrival and growth of industry does not always mean social progress, as we're told to be. Interesting as well, over the last century, as industries have grown tremendously and our lives ever more enriched, there is an undeniable but converse correlation where pollution levels and uh, natural resource depletion have also risen tremendously. There is an environmental cost to modern development because businesses utilize environmental resources to create products and through this process, pollution is oftentimes created in its aftermath. Although businesses can attempt to take measures to you know, try and divert and reduce the adverse environmental effects, by default, efficiency is pursued at the expense of sustainability because the core purpose of companies under our economic model is to create returns to investors. Therefore, the focus is on producing as much as possible in the most cost-effective manner. And as such, businesses are not structurally designed to really review the environmental impact unless it presents great financial return potential. We don't really think much about this paradox. This paradox of progress, as I call it, because we enjoy the immediate value that's being offered by business that we don't really think about the process. For example, Many of us here have and enjoy fashionable clothes, clothes we probably bought from places like Zara, Topshop, H&M, and the likes. And it's great, isn't it? Nowadays, we can access global high fashion on a regular basis um, in an affordable way from almost anywhere in the world. You can find a Zara almost anywhere in the world. And it's just so different compared to before. No longer are we behind on the trends. And today, because of business, fashion is something that is accessible globally accessible. 
But fast fashion has, with its focus on speed and low cost, in order to deliver affordable collections throughout the world, been particularly bad on the environment because pressure to reduce time and cost means environmental corners are effectively cut. And as such, there is an adverse impact to all this. For example, the vibrant colors and materials are achieved with cheap chemicals, with textile dyeing now the second largest polluter of clean water globally. Polyester, the most commonly used fabric for fast fashion, also sheds microfibers on wash, and this increases the level of plastics in our waterways, destroying our environment slowly but surely. Not to mention the immense amounts of waste that's being created that we're not even struggling to really dispose of. So, should businesses then be responsible for carrying the burden of tackling the environmental challenges of our society? Well, that is an ironic thing to think about when you realize that businesses are the largest perpetrators of many of these challenges to begin with. Therefore, you know, as our industries have boomed over the last century, our environment has been very much doomed. Now, at this point, some of you might think, surely there is a silver lining in all this, you know, Yes, there's bound to be hiccups, but nothing is perfect in the universe, and at least true to its purpose, the world is getting wealthier. That's been the point, really. While reality is interesting, to say the least, because when we examine the overall figures from an overall perspective, yes, the world's total wealth is growing, but on closer inspection, you find something quite disturbing, where it seems to su su suggest that success breeds success, because statistically, the rich are getting so much more richer, while the poor, they don't enjoy the same level of growth, or worse, they remain poor. Growth of wealth has not been the same for everyone, but in fact, starkly different, and this has been proven through empirical studies through the years. And what's even more interesting is that this is reflected not only on an individual level, but also on a global level, where the gap between the richest and poorest nations, despite the global growth of wealth, has remained very large. In fact, according to a recent report by the World Bank, today, and this is a very recent report, today, the gap between the nation, wealth gap between the nations is extremely large, not correlating to the total growth of wealth globally. And there are even some countries where per capita wealth has actually fallen. In other words, under our model, there are actually people who are getting poorer. These are important issues that we must consider because poverty and unequal wealth distribution are prominent barriers to development. Therefore, when we say that the world is getting richer, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, are we all getting richer together? Has it been the same story for, for us all? Quite frankly, no. And oddly as well, with wealth increasingly centralized in our economy through big business and players, there's also increased vulnerability to wealth itself as well. And this really jeopardizes and threatens the sustainability of wealth, as any little upheaval can spell immense economic disasters and even crisis. And through the centuries, we can think of so many examples of this. And this really brings us to question our model of progress today. So ultimately, we can see today that our model for the world has really exposed our society to some very interesting issues, despite being told of the great progress in recent times. We are still challenged by great issues, many of which are paradoxically perpetuated by the way that we've actually progressed. Our model of the world has exposed us and facilitated questionable growth, and it's exposed us to disastrous vulnerabilities to our society, all of which makes us really question how much better we're really getting in this world, and whether the current model for development really provides us a means to develop in a very sustainable way. Rather than think about how much of the world we can own through entrepreneurship, and rather than think about you know, how much wealth we can seemingly generate through startup expansion, rather than see these as the barometers of success and the ideals we strive towards, we should instead think about how we can address the problems of the world, meet its needs through entrepreneurship. In other words, what I'm saying is that we should reconceptualize how we think about entrepreneurship, and the purpose and the place of the entrepreneur in society. We should incorporate sustainability as an equally important ideal, component, and consideration in our pursuits of progress and development. Although what I'm talking about today 
is essentially a mindset shift. We shouldn't overlook, overlook the importance of it because each of us sitting here, every one of you, is a participant in the development of our world, a world that we occupy together. And many of you, I have no doubts, will one day become great entrepreneurs, change makers, people in positions of impact and power. But as we strive to become more successful in our lives, as we strive to really celebrate our progress, we need to ask ourselves, how successful are we truly? Because are we making the world better? Well, let's rewind for a moment, reset our definition of better, and then answer that. Thank you. <laughs>